In this episode of the St. Philip Institute podcast, we're going to be talking about Lumen Gentium, the dogmatic constitution on the Church from the Second Vatican Council, and we're really going to focus on just two things. What are the roles and responsibilities of bishops in the Church, and what are the roles and responsibilities of the laity? I hope you enjoy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Eternal Father, you called St. Philip the Evangelist to open his mouth and begin with Scripture, tell the good news of Jesus Christ. By virtue of our baptism, we too are called to work for the salvation of souls. Instill in our hearts the zeal of St. Philip that we may convert hearts and minds to your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, welcome back to the St. Philip Institute podcast. My name is Luke Arredondo, and I'm the Director of Faith Formation here at the St. Philip Institute, and we are continuing our series on the Second Vatican Council, the four major documents of that council. Uh, if you've missed any of the previous episodes, go ahead and check them out on our YouTube. We've talked about uh, the council as a whole, and we also talked about the document on the liturgy. Right now, we are working our way through the document on the Church, the dogmatic constitution on the Church, Lumen Gentium. Um, so in this conversation, um, what I'm going to be kind of reviewing is really chapter 3 and chapter 4 of the document Lumen Gentium. Um, in the first two chapters, which we've, which we've already spoken about, uh, what you see the Council Fathers doing is giving an overview of, about the purpose and function of the Church, like why we have a Church, why Christ established a Church, and what it's supposed to be doing in the world, and in, particularly, and, and in particular, the ways in which everybody is called into that Church. So there is, just like we saw in the document on the liturgy, the document on the Church, very much has this vision that everybody is called to Catholic unity, and these are all of the reasons why that is the case. Um, the Church on Earth basically functions as a continuation of the people of God from the Scriptures, the Israelites in the Old Testament. Um, so the vision that the document on the Church in particular is really building on is, just like in the Scripture document, it's a salvation history perspective. So in salvation history, God creates the world, and he calls people to him, forms covenants with them, and establishes leadership through the Israelites, through people like Moses and David. Uh, and as history moves forward, the church is renewed with the new covenant and Christ. Christ then sends the apostles, the apostles are the church, and, the, and that continues. So uh, the, the way that the document on the church, Lumen Gentium, understands everything is that we are connected in the church now to Christ the same way that the apostles were. And in the introduction, or the beginning rather, of this third chapter, um, the council actually notes specifically that this is a document, this is a teaching about the church that continues the work that was done at Vatican I. So we talk a lot about Vatican II today. Um, there's, there's not nearly as much discussion about Vatican I, although there's, there's certainly some. Um, but what happened essentially is the first Vatican Council um, was supposed to have a, a wide range of documents that were going to be produced, a lot of subjects that were going to be discussed, and it got interrupted by the Franco-Prussian War. So all they really accomplished was two documents, one of which focused on the papacy and papal infallibility. So in the section that we're talking about today, chapter 3 basically talks about bishops, chapter 4 talks about laity. So there was an, an initial understanding at Vatican I that there would be an ecclesiological document that talked about the papacy and bishops, priests, deacons, and the laity, and was going to cover all of those. And it only got as far as the papacy. So chapter 3 of Lumen Gentium, if, if you look at the beginning of chapter 3, the Church is very clear that this is following the work of Vatican I, which addressed the function and nature of the papacy. And now, in chapter 3 of Lumen Gentium, the Church is going to work through and present 
uh, a clear understanding of the nature of especially the episcopacy, what bishops are supposed to be doing, what their function is. There is some talk about the priesthood and the diaconate, but it's, it's very short. There's going to be another There's another uh, document that we're not going to discuss in this series more specifically about the priesthood, but there is a ton of stuff about the episcopacy. What is a bishop uh, in this third chapter that I want to kind of get into? Um, and really, the the way that the document understands the function of bishops or the episcopacy is similar to the way that it understands the papacy, and that's that in the scriptures, right, we clearly have the papacy being established and maintaining the idea that it continues. So Peter is not the only pope. He passes that on to the next popes, right? So any successor of Peter is playing the same role that Peter had. They are the pope. They are the supreme pontiff. They have all that authority. Just as we see that clearly with the papacy, Lumen Gentium wants to say that is where we're at with bishops and the apostles. So as when we talk about the papacy, the church proclaims that Peter passes down that ministry to, to the subsequent popes. Uh, in the episcopacy, the council here is proclaiming that bishops are the successors to the apostles, and not just historically, like there was an apostle and then there was a bishop that came after. So it's not just historical lineage, but even in some sense they share the function and purpose of the original apostles. And you see this um, throughout the third chapter of Lumen Gentium. So I want to um, highlight just a couple of, of quotes where we sort of see this understanding being laid out. First, in paragraph 20 of Lumen Gentium, we, we have uh, the, the Council Fathers kind of lay it out this way. They say, "...among those various ministries, which according to tradition were exercised in the Church from the earliest times, the chief place belongs to the office of those who appointed to the episcopate, so bishops, by a succession running from the beginning are, I love this phrase, the, so the bishops are passers on of the apostolic seed. Thus, as St. Irenaeus testifies, through those who were appointed bishops by the apostles and through their successors down into our own time, the apostolic tradition is manifested and preserved. So the bishops pass on the apostolic seed, and they maintain or manifest and preserve the apostolic faith. So this is the, the, the fundamental purpose of bishops, and it's why we have them. And just as uh, we, we originally had Peter, who, and this, this, this transitions into the papacy, the apostles sort of transition into the episcopacy, the bishops. And, and that is, uh, I, I think, an important thing um, for us to grasp. One of the big things that's going on in the, the discussion of the, uh, the, the role of the bishops in this third chapter uh, is that the bishop is not merely someone who's kind of underneath the pope, that the pope outranks them, and so the bishops aren't important on their own. Um, of course, a bishop doesn't have universal jurisdiction over everything that happens in the church, but they do have, as legitimate successors to the apostles, quite a lot of responsibility, quite a lot of privileges, um, and they're not merely like a hireling for the Pope, which I think is a pretty common way that people tend to understand them. You think, so you got you know, regular lay people, you got a deacon, you got a priest, you got a bishop, uh, and then, you know, there's cardinals and popes, and, and like that's just literally a rank of importance, you know, um, but but really... Bishops have a tremendous amount of importance. They're not so far removed from the Pope that it's like they're not important at all. Um, so later in that same paragraph, paragraph 20, uh, the text says, And just as the office granted individually to Peter, the first among the apostles, is permanent and is to be transmitted to his successors, so also the apostles' office of nurturing the Church is permanent and is to be exercised without interruption by the sacred order of bishops. So therefore, the sacred council teaches that bishops, by divine institution, have succeeded to the place of the apostles. So when you see a bishop, right, uh, you should at least a little bit in your mind think, wow, that's like seeing an apostle, because that's what the church is saying, that these are the successors of the apostles, and not just that we can kind of trace it, everything goes back to the apostles, but that that teaching office of the apostles is still in place. Um, so at Vatican I, there was a lot of discussion about the papacy and infallibility and the, the uh, sort of 
special privileges that are granted to the Pope because of the role that he plays, which is distinct from the bishops. In Lumen Gentium chapter 3, there's a lot of discussion about the way that bishops as a body cooperate with the church, or cooperate rather with the Pope, and form a college of bishops. And there, I, there's one important line that I want to emphasize. It's that you become a bishop, Lumen Gentium says, not just by consecration, which is critical, right? You can't just be a bishop. Uh, you have to be ordained. You have to be consecrated as a bishop. But you also have to maintain union with the Pope. And that's because the body of the church must be united to its head. So bishops are a function of, or is rather a visible sign of, of the unity of their particular church. A lot of the theology of the episcopacy that's laid out in this third chapter of Lumen Gentium has to do with the fact that bishops have a particular local church. And you see this um, in some practical ways. Uh, One real easy example is what age is confirmation in the Latin rite, right? A bishop basically gets to decide what age that's going to be. Uh, and one bishop in, in, in a bordering territory near to, near to another bishop may have a very different understanding of, of when is the right time to confirm someone. That's something that is not a universal practice. It's dependent upon the prudential judgment of a bishop who has the right and the power in his diocese to make that sort of a ruling. Um, so throughout this chapter, there's there's a lot of discussion about what is a bishop supposed to do? Okay, they're successors to the apostles. What does that mean? And one of the clear things that underlies the theology is it means bishops are supposed to preserve the faith. They're supposed to teach. They're supposed to judge. They're supposed to govern within their diocese. But really, that role of teaching is heavily emphasized. Um, I, before we started recording, was talking to our director of communications, Elizabeth Slayton. Uh, I've read Lumen Gentium before, but uh, reading about bishops when um, you don't really work with one or see one very often is is so different than reading this document now that I, I work for a bishop. I see one probably almost every day during the week. I see, I see Bishop Strickland. Um, the extreme responsibilities that are given to them in this document are very, very weighty. And I think, man, I really got to pray for Bishop Strickland and for all bishops because the duty of teaching that they are entrusted with is really significant. So let me read just briefly from the 25th paragraph of uh, Lumen Gentium. Among the principal duties of bishops, the preaching of the gospel occupies an eminent place. For bishops are preachers of the faith who lead new disciples to Christ, and they are authentic teachers. That is, they are teachers endowed with the authority of Christ, who preach to the people committed to them the faith they must believe and put into practice, and by the light of the Holy Spirit illustrate that faith. They bring forth from the treasury of Revelation new things and old, making it, Revelation, bear fruit and vigilantly warding off any errors that threaten their flock. Bishops teaching in communion with the Roman pontiff are to be respected by all as witnesses to divine and Catholic truth. That is an extraordinary responsibility. And it needs to be said, bishops having this responsibility for preaching, for teaching, for leading new disciples to Christ— for uh, witnessing by the light of the Holy Spirit, illustrating what the apostolic faith looks like by the, the witness of their life, is maybe something that we haven't seen enough of. Uh, it's certainly not the case that everywhere, every bishop is just killing it with this list of uh, responsibilities. It's, of course, not the case that like every bishop is just terrible and not doing any of these things at all. That's not what I'm trying to say. Rather, we've got to realize and pray for our bishops how much responsibility is on their shoulders. And we need to shift from the very common view that, you know, oh, to be a bishop means you're, you're the CEO of the diocese. Even if legally they are the CEO in some sort of way, their primary function is to teach. We need to make it easier for bishops to have that option, to have that uh, possibility of really doing teaching, of having a ministry of teaching. We need to pray for them, support them. Those that are trying to do it, we need to uh, you know, encourage them. 
They are to teach, lead new disciples to Christ, to be authentic teachers with the authority of Christ, and to demonstrate by the light of the Holy Spirit what that faith looks like when it's lived. Um, so another kind of key point here in, in this chapter is that, that the bishop is not just a branch, man, branch manager for the Vatican. Uh, they make specific laws in their own diocese, especially anything pertaining to the order of worship and the apostolate. Um, and bishops are told in, in Lumen Gentium that they need to understand priests as co-workers with them, um, so that the bishop kind of really has the main responsibility for the diocese, and the priests are those who are helping him to accomplish that goal. So it, it's really easy, you know, thinking we do have a hierarchy, but it's not a strict hierarchy in the sense that, like, there's there's one rank, and that's priest, and they have, like, this little thing that they do, and then bishops have something more important that they do. Really, the ecclesiology here is that the bishop has responsibility for everything in the diocese, and the priests are those who are going to help him. Now, the priests get their own duly established authority over their parish, but they only have that authority as long as they are in communion with their bishop. So it's really a, a co-workers, a, a partnership between the priests and the bishop of the diocese to really fulfill all the functions of, of ministry that are supposed to happen within the diocese. Now, there's plenty more that you could say about the role of bishops in this uh, document, um, but I want to transition to talking about the fourth chapter of Lumen Gentium, uh, which talks about the laity. This is one of my favorite chapters of the Vatican II documents and one of my favorite sections of any church document. Now, you may think to yourself, ooh, what a, what a, what a list, I, you know, one of your favorite chapters of church documents. But I, lo I love a lot of church documents. I'm super nerdy about it. I, I, I'm just, it's a really big passion of mine to, to read the church's documents. This stuff about the lady in chapter four of Lumen Gentium, I think, is some of the most under- uh, it's a, it's one of our best kept secrets. It's not appreciated. It's underappreciated for the value of what the church is trying to call the laity to. Now, there's a separate chapter, which I'll talk about in the next episode, on the universal call to holiness. Before the council even gets to proclaiming really clearly what the universal call to holiness is, it says these are the responsibilities of the laity. So I'm just going to read to you one, two, three, four, five, hopefully just five quotations. We'll see if I can limit myself to that that I think are just tremendously rich, and that if you knew only one thing about Vatican II, if you're a lay person, which probably most people listening to this are, these are the things I think you probably should latch onto the most because they could change your life if you were to take them seriously. So this is first from paragraph 31. They, and it means the laity, live in the ordinary circumstances of family and social life from which their very web of existence is woven. They are called there by God that by exercising their proper function and led by the spirit of the gospel, they may work for the sanctification of the world from within as a leaven. Therefore, since they are tightly bound up in all types of temporal affairs, the, la the laity are, right? It is their special task to order and throw light upon these affairs in such a way that they may come into being and then continually increase according to Christ, to the praise of the Creator and the Redeemer. So this is the function of the laity. One of the, one of the key quotes from, from, the, from the entire Second Vatican Council, the laity are called specifically by God into these circumstances of ordinary social life to serve as a leaven from within. Why is that such a big deal? Well, one of the reasons it's so important is because it's trying to clearly explain that, and the, the, you see this throughout all of the documents of the Council, evangelization and witness are really needed in the modern world. And the responsibility for who's going to do that evangelization does not fall all on the priests, on the hierarchy, even on religious in fact, a great portion of it, especially sort of a, a pre-evangelization or a charismatic sort of witness, falls on the laity because it is by being out in the world, in the normal, ordinary circumstances where the laity find themselves, working as a teacher, as a mechanic, as an engineer, wherever it is that you work, right? Being with your friends and your family in those social places where, you know, the church isn't going to reach very well. 
Bishop Barron reaches a huge number of Catholics. He does not reach hardly any of them percentage-wise, okay? Uh, the, the greatest preachers that we've ever had, even when they reach millions of people, it's in a very small way. But in your day-to-day life as a layperson, you are called by God to that place so that by exercising your baptismal dignity, by living a life led by the Holy Spirit— you can sanctify that place wherever it is, right? And now, obviously, there's like some little limits to that. Like, if where you work is, you know, a a haven of sin, uh, and there's just nothing redeemable redeemable about it, you you probably should leave, right? But in in, in most cases, like, people aren't just like, you know, you're not a mafia boss. You just have a regular job. You got friends. You're called there, to be a witness to the gospel, to be a witness to what it looks like to live the Christian life, to be uh, to work for the sanctification of the world from within as eleven, and we, the lady, get this special task that priests and bishops and, and monks and nuns are in most cases going to be incapable of actually doing, because if you're where a priest and monk or nun is. In most cases, that means you're already at least somewhat open to the church. You were willing to go to where those people are found. The laity, we, the baptized, have this job to go out into these other places and serve as a witness to the gospel, serve as an agent of evangelization. So that's paragraph 31. It's one of my favorite quotes from Vatican II, um, one of my favorite quotes from any church document. All right, so that's the first one. Now, I'm going to jump all the way to paragraph number 33 and show you again what the laity are called to. Okay, this is paragraph 33 of Lumen Gentium. Through their baptism and confirmation, all are commissioned to that apostolate, the lay apostolate, by the Lord himself. So baptism and confirmation commission us as part of the lay apostolate. Moreover, by the sacraments, especially the Holy Eucharist, that charity toward God and man, which is the soul of the apostolate, is communicated and nourished. Now, the laity are called in a special way to make the church present and operative in those places and circumstances where only through them can it become the salt of the earth. Again, only through the laity are some people going to be reached by the gospel. They're just not going to be in a church. They're not going to be found, you know, going, just showing up for faith formation. They're just not just going to wander in and try and say, hey, can I go to confession? I mean, does that happen sometimes? Sure, but extremely limited. What the church was already recognizing, and think, you know, this is 1964, I believe, when this document was promulgated. Already the church realized, We've got to go out and be the ones doing this. The laity have to be taking this message out there, or it's not going to reach the people that it really needs to reach. We have to be operative in places and circumstances where it was only through us, the laity, that we can show people what it means to become the salt of the earth. And what what motivates that or what makes that possible? Baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist. A lot of people, a lot of Catholics especially, uh, or not especially, but a lot of Catholics will see baptism, confirmation, and Eucharist as just things that we got to do, things that we have to receive, and it's good to receive them. But in the Church's understanding, those sacraments call us, actually call us to missionary work, and more important, make it possible for that to be fruitful. So when you see confirmation as being linked to evangelization in this way, or the Eucharist as being that which is going to prepare you to go out and make a witness in the places of the world where no one else can do it, then it really becomes a very different thing. It becomes a very different sort of understanding of what it is to be a layperson. So so then then you would see, for instance, um, and, and I know many people for, for whom this is the case, when you see these truths and you, and you realize what the calling is of the laity, you shift from uh, Mass is important because I am required to attend it, which is true. You're required to be there. But you move from that sort of minimalistic understanding, like I have to go and be at the Mass, to I need to go and receive the Lord so that he can give the grace to me that I need to go out and be a witness to him 
in the ordinary fabric of my life, including in my family and my friendships, relationships in the in the world, just wherever I am. But that, that mission even includes be a, to your own family, right? That's really where it starts. Um, there is a, a quote that I, I, th- I think that I've got uh, highlighted here um, about the way family life is so instrumental to evangelization and how the lady just living a, a normal life in your family actually can be a profound witness. This is paragraph 35. Um, yeah, 35. Where Christianity pervades the entire mode of family life and gradually transforms it, one will find there both the practice and an excellent school of the lay apostolate. So what the council is saying is when your faith completely soaks in to be uh, constitutive of your entire life and not just a bonus thing you do on the weekends or at Lent, uh, it will transform everything about your life and it will make just your family life an apostolate. Just being authentically devoted to Christ in your family transforms your family into an apostolate. But that's not all. There's more. Um, (laughs) Sounds like a commercial. In such a home, one of these homes where the faith is uh, saturated family life completely, in such a home, husbands and wives find their proper vocation in being witnesses of the faith and love of Christ to one another and to their children. Now listen to this sentence, and I'm sure our director of family life will love this line. The Christian family loudly proclaims both the present virtues of the kingdom of God and the hope of a blessed life to come. Thus, by its example and its witness, it accuses the world of sin and enlightens those who seek the truth. That is a calling that the laity experience in a different way than any of the hierarchy or um, the clerics. You are not always they are not always going to have that opportunity and we do as lady we have this this remarkable opportunity um to be present in ways that are going to shine forth as witnesses to other people and i'm sure probably all of you listening can think of one or two families a handful of people that you've known in your life that anybody that met them thought oh there is just something different about this family like just everything they do is different uh nobody is like them they're totally unique and they, they love everybody, and they're like, what is the thing that's at the root of that family? And very often it's the faith has taken its root completely. It's all the way integrated into their life, and it's not a bonus thing. One of the, the principles in this fourth chapter that the, the church talks about is trying to integrate all both of the, the pieces of our life, our faith and what happens when we're out in public, and that those need to be united together. Let me read you um, another, another quote from Lumen Gentium. I've got two more to read here. This is paragraph 36. Christ has communicated the, this royal power uh, to his disciples that they may be constituted in royal freedom and that by true penance and a holy life they might conquer the reign of sin in themselves. We're called to conquer the reign of sin in ourselves. I was trying to explain to my daughter the other day um, what it meant to be a saint, that you go to heaven, it means you're in heaven, you went to heaven directly after dying, and we were talking about purgatory, and and she was saying, well, if you go to purgatory, you still get to go to heaven, right? And I said, yeah, that's true. And she was like, well, that's good, then I just like, I hope I can make it to purgatory. And I was like, look, I'm not saying I want you to go to hell, Uh, I don't, (laughs) but you shouldn't just be shooting for purgatory, because purgatory... It's, it's, it's going to be—it's not going to be fun. And she said, well, what is it? I said, well, I, I mean, I haven't been there, but it is— you've got to be completely purified of even wanting to sin. Even the allure of sin has to be completely off the table for you to, to enter into heaven, because we can't enter into heaven unless we're completely 100% purified. And that work, some of it we can do on our own now if— We said about conquering the reign of sin in ourselves. And that doesn't mean it's our effort that makes it possible. It's Christ that makes it possible through our participation, through our cooperation with his grace. Augustine said that God created the world without us, but he won't save us without our participation. Right? We have to be cooperating with it. It's the grace that's primary, but we also have to have the cooperation. So in this chapter, the fourth chapter, Lumen Gentium, 
the council is giving this tremendous summons to the lady to go out and be an excellent doctor, lawyer, teacher, artist, architect, mechanic, musician, whatever. Do those things and be authentically a witness to the gospel. Let it pervade your entire life. And when enough people do that, then the kingdom of God can really make inroads into the secular culture. And look, this was written in 1964. Uh, Things have gotten worse since then. There's less participation in the church, less belief. All the more urgent, therefore, for us to take this message and really take it seriously. Just as the bishops, uh, you know, need to take seriously the the duties and responsibilities that are outlaid, that are laid out for them in chapter three. We, the lady, need to really take seriously this call, this summons to be a witness in the ordinary circumstances of social life where we find ourselves and where the clerics and the religious likely aren't going to be able to be effective. So I'll, find, I'll just close out here by, by, by giving the, the last line from Lumen Gentium chapter three for the, or 4 for the lady. This is the summary of everything. In a word, Christians must be to the world what the soul is to the body. Thanks. Thanks.